I don't know whether you have fancy slides. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> so we will, um, <clears throat> let me just put this up here so we have something nice behind you. And um, you can talk with that. Excellent. <laughs> just get that out someplace. All right. <coughs> Thank you, Barry.
So we did that with the city. And if you go on the web, um, I highly recommend it because it basically will tell you anything I could ever tell you about sustainable cities. Plan P L A N Y C. Just Google that. I hated the graphic. It was Plan N Y C, but it's P L N Y C. In any event, Google that, and you will get their 122 measure sustainability plan for the city of New York, which the chief features of which uh, are that the city promised promises by 2030 to add a million people, so go from eight and a half million to nine and a half million, reduce its energy use and its carbon footprint for climate change purposes by north of 40 percent. It's actually a 30 percent carbon reduction by 2030, but because you're adding a million people on top of the ones that are already there, it's more than a 40 percent net reduction which is astronomical compared to what most everybody is trying to do on climate change these days. And the city has a really interesting and aggressive program to do that, and there are two critical elements in it. Because New York City is the most energy efficient, it is compact, but the real secret to New York City, and why it's better than everywhere else in America, certainly, is transit. No one in New York City gets in a car to buy a quarter milk. No. Everyone in the rest of America gets in a car, drives a 4,000 pound vehicle to the nearest market, which is usually pretty far away, to buy a quart of milk and bring it home. Nothing like that happens in New York City. 85% of all trips in New York City are foot, bike, or transit. And therefore, its transportation footprint for carbon environmental performance purposes is vastly better than anywhere else. Um, and they have plans to do way better than that. The two elements of their sustainability plan are the most critical features. Transportation, they're going to do cordon pricing if Albany ever lets them get away with it, to actually charge for entrance into the city the way London is doing, Singapore and other cities. Um, and they are going to try uh, to fix every building for its energy consumption. Buildings in a city like Boston or New York consume north of 60% of all the energy consumed in the city. Goes into heating, cooling, lighting, buildings like this. More than 60%. In New York City, it is 72% of all energy used by the city is building energy systems. And so the goal is to reduce that through massive retrofit of all the existing building stock. Uh, there are only 980,000 buildings in New York City. <laughs> That means by 2030, if we're going to get this 40% reduction, we have to fix them all because there are really about 400 of them that are really pretty good, especially the new LEED certified ones. But all the other ones need to be worked on. That's 50,000 buildings a year. Wow. Talk about a jobs opportunity. <laughs> there aren't enough plumbers in all of New York City to do that work. This is a great job generator. It can't be outsourced. It can't be offshore. It's local people making major restorative investments in their own place, in their own city, in their own neighborhoods, making them more energy efficient, solving the climate change problem, making the city more potent, competitive, prosperous. Really interesting stuff. That is what their sustainability plan says. Um, so having said that, I'm sort of done with cities and sustainability. Okay, you sort of got that message, read Plan YC, and you're off and running. Um, Two, I wanted to then talk about two interesting elements. First, um, what's the largest energy user in your house? Fridge. Fridge rate. That's a good, good answer. It was 20 years out of date. Yes, ma'am? The stuff that glows at night. The stuff that glows at night. Good answer. Good answer. Good answer. Actually, it's your plasma TV. It used to be your fridge. Your fridge used to be a 260-watt continuous-use energy consumer. And now, and since uh, federal legislation started with state legislation in this state and a bunch of other states where we hammered away on appliance efficiencies, forced the appliance manufacturers to produce better stuff, fridges now consume 60 watts of energy. They're like a 60-watt light bulb. Reduced, it's not me. The little guy's off, I'll turn the iPhone off. Turn the iPhone off. Okay. Uh, the uh, plasma TV is your largest 
energy consumer. It is like hanging a refrigerator on your wall. Uh, it does consume 250 watts continuously, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Why is that? Because we don't turn them off, because we're all so damn lazy that when we sit down and hit the clicker, we want the screen to go bright immediately, unlike your laptop when you have to turn it on from scratch and it takes a while to warm up. America's manufacturers decided that we were all impatient and therefore the, the TV had to be on all the time. So it's on all the time. And the answer of all the things that glow in the dark, 20% of all energy used in your home are the things that glow in the dark that you can't turn off even though they're supposed to be off. Your cell phone chargers that are plugged into the wall but not into the phone. The, the uh, clock in the microwave oven, which uses more energy than the microwave oven. <laughs> I mean, really, think about that. How dumb is that? You can't even turn the thing off. You can't get it to tell the right time unless you're 14 years old. Um, so, why am I talking to you about this? Because cities are an incredibly interesting place to mine that energy waste. And here's the best example. Hot water heaters are the largest installed battery in America. A battery is a place that stores energy, right? So hot water heaters store a huge amount of energy. There are 100 million electric hot water heaters in America. My goal in life and my next career is to own all of them. <laughs> I'll start with this group. I want you to sell me your hot water heater. I actually will give you a free hot water heater. I mean, those of you who are homeowners or have been in, in, in your own homes or when you were kids or whatever, of course, hot water heaters, they sit in the basement and they do their thing and they keep the water hot and then they break every 10 years and they flood the basement and you come home and, they, you know, and your wife says, you know, there's no hot water, you're down in this basement, it's hot water, and you call the plumber and you say, uh, well, you know, we don't have any hot water. The plumber arrives a day later, you got to wait around all day, the plumber shows up, says, yeah, well, okay, yeah, you got to go. Plus the water here, I got a new one in the truck. And you say, no, 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 I want a really efficient one. Homer says, oh, yeah, really efficient. Well, this is. And you look at the little label on it, they're all labeled now, and it sucks. It's not efficient. So you say, no, 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 I want a really efficient one, you know, one of those good ones. He says, oh, right, yeah, I could get you one of those from Canada. It'll be 10 days. What do you do? You install the crummy hot water here, right? Because you need the hot water. I want to be available to you. You're going to call me up. Oh, my water is broke. I'm going to show up on your front door. I'm going to give you a hot water heater. It's going to be a super efficient one. And what it's going to have in it is a switch, a wireless switch that will allow me, you have to agree to this, of course, <laughs> to turn it off for 20 minutes 10 times a year. 10 times a year. 20 minutes. Now, you won't even know it's off because it's got 42 gallons of hot water unless you want to take a continuous bath where you'll keep running the water and shower and run every goddamn box to me. Clients in your, uh, in your house, you're not going to know it's off. But when it's off, I'm going to turn it off on the hottest days in the summer when Boston's power supply is being driven by the dirtiest plants in, the, in New England to keep the lights and the air conditioning running. We're going to turn off all those hot water heaters for 20 minutes and we're going to sell the power to the grid. And it's worth a fortune because it's the functional equivalent of having a huge power plant, a huge installed battery. The only way it can happen is all of us have to do it together. We need to be organized. And the best place to organize it is a city. So the cities become the world's future energy mines. They are the oil fields under our feet. And it's all the energy waste that we're currently wa uh, wasting here in all these devices that need to be turned off even for a moment. So that's item one, one of my goals in life. And help me out. I want all the hot water heaters. There'll be little forms in the back at the end. Second thing, Paul asked me to talk about, OK, so we have all this gold. And Barry, Barry is right. There was this remarkable work done partly during my time in office by Barry and many others on reforming Massachusetts' approach to housing and, and uh, affordability. Um, one of the challenges was getting the state agencies to go along with that. So I 
Astrid and I, and a handful of others, got tasked with the burden of trying to get all these agencies to play in the same sandbox together. Transportation, housing, environment, and energy. So here's the inside scoop on what that means. You gotta start with the understanding that the people that work in these agencies have very different cultures. The transportation culture is an engineering culture. These are people that care about concrete and bridge steel, and are things going to, how long is the road going to last, and is the bridge going to fall, is the Longfellow Bridge going to fall in the Charles River, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Very, very hard-headed engineering. They're not really people people. <laughs> um, but well-meaning and serious professional folks. The housing people, on the other hand, who never talked to the transportation people, when we sat down for our first cabinet meeting amongst my agencies, we had all the folks gathering, we had the head of the housing agency, a lovely person who'd been in government for many, many years, and the head of the MBTA, among other things, who had been running the transit agency for a number of years, and they introduced each other to themselves. Hi, I'm Mike Mulhern, hi, I'm Jane Gumbel. They had never met. They'd been in government for 15 years each, 20 years each, they'd never met. Okay, so that siloed effect is a big problem. The housing people are really progressive. They're sort of like Barrett. Um, you know, very progressive, socially motivated, uh, equity and all the rest. The enviros are zealots. Okay, they really are sort of a religious fervor. Um, and they don't pay any attention to housing whatsoever. And the energy folks are all geeks, techno geeks. I mean, they're, they're into this sort of hot water heater thing. And, um, and so we actually had to get them all to, you know, sort of have a similar strategy. So we did a bunch of things to make that happen. Um, it was pointed out to me, many of you have heard this story, but it was pointed out to me that Commonwealth Development, this agency that we were running, um, had these four sub-parts, was sort of like the definition of European heaven and hell. You've all, all heard that, right? Uh, European heaven is the British or the police and the Germans are the engineers and the French are the chefs and the Italians are the lovers and the Swiss are the administrators and then European hell is the British or the chefs and the <laughs> Germans are the police. Um, the French are the engineers. You know, Peugeot, you ever owned a Peugeot? <laughs> uh, the Italians are the administrators. <laughs> Look at Berlusconi, I mean, really. And the Swiss of the lovers. <laughs> and so our challenge was to land on the heaven side of that definition versus the hell. But Commonwealth development was all about how you put all this together. And so we did it in a bunch of different ways. But the, really, the secret we did, you know, we stormed around the Commonwealth. We talked about smart growth. We talked about um, New England villages. We talked about urban neighborhoods. We talked about transit-oriented development. We got people to think about the fact that their towns needed to have a place where their children, their grown children, um, could live. I, my daughter was raised in a suburb of Boston where we lived for a long time. She fledges, she goes off to college, she comes back, she's 22 years old. There's nowhere in the town she can live. There's not a single rental unit in the town. It's all single-family homes. The only place she could live was my house. <laughs> Big problem. So, uh, so we talked to all the suburbs about that. But the secret of what we did, and Astrid was a critical piece of this, was we seized the capital budgets. We seized control of all the capital spending. If you want to turn an agency in a different direction, gain control of where they put their capital. Nothing else really matters. Because that's what you build with all that money is what's going to be here for 50 years. Grab that, you gain control. If all you do is talk about policy, if all you do is talk about regulation, that's fine, it's all well and good, it's important. But if you ignore capital spending, you ignore the guts of the agencies. And those four agencies have a lot of capital. So we seized it all to try to guide it in a more sensible direction. And I think we made some, some dents in this. We broke up a bunch of silos. We spun a bunch of folks that went off. Astrid went off. She was in charge of the transportation agency. It made them incredibly nervous because she had come out of the transportation agency. And she came over to our office, and all of a sudden they knew there was somebody 
In our office, they knew everything about the inside and how they tried to hide everything. So that was really <laughs> quite wonderful. We had the same thing. The woman that uh, was in charge of the environmental agency, if you will, that was sort of their babysitter, came out of the environmental agency, um, Gina McCarthy. After she was done with a Massachusetts and Commonwealth Development, she went off and ran the environmental agency in Connecticut and is now in charge of air quality, air pollution at EPA federally. She's a big deal. She's in charge of climate change. Um, so these were really potent people. Astrid went off to New York. Um, and we managed the agencies by knowing more about what they were doing than they knew themselves. Um, and we took their money. Um, so that was a societal busting exercise. I'll leave you with um, two thoughts. Uh, if you're serious about land use and you're serious about cities and you're serious about stop and scrawl, smart growth, you've got to gain control of zoning. Barry has spent his career working on that and has made an enormous amount of progress. Boston Foundation has put enormous resources into trying to crack through the zoning barriers in this state. Uh, that prevent housing from being built, multifamily housing from being built. You've got to get control of land use. Um, you've got to get control of the way transportation investments are made and how they weave together with land use. Because transportation investments, capital investments on sewer, water, transit, whatever, drive land use. And it needs to be the reverse. The land use needs to drive the capital investments. And the other uh, thing, and I'll leave you with this, is that I did the greenest thing I will do today, the most environmentally responsible thing I did today, I did this morning when I got up. I went downstairs and I went to eat my bowl of granola and I had no milk and I walked out the door and I bought a quart of milk down the street and I walked home. Um, and it was the single greenest thing I did. And if all of us who care about cities, do nothing else in the rest of our life. You need to live somewhere where you can walk for milk. And it doesn't have to be a city. It can be a little Vermont town. But you've got to be able to walk for milk. Because it will change the way you affect the landscape and the way you affect sustainability. I live downtown Boston on the water. I walk for everything. I visit my car once every two or three weeks just to make sure it's okay. Um, but I hardly ever use it. Thanks very much, Barry.